and a very warm welcome to this video. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, for joining it. You might recognise this monument to Ben Johnson, which is in Westminster Abbey. He's looking over to the monument to William Shakespeare, and he has three buttons on the wrong side of his coat. He is a what's called a turncoat, probably tells us a little bit about his relationship to the memory of William Shakespeare. Underneath it, uh, four words if you're reading in English, O rare Ben Jonson, three if you're reading in Latin, O rare Ben Jonson, be thou arisen Ben Jonson, uh, which gives some sense of the mind games that Jonson always liked to play. He was something of an intellectual snob, and his poems and his plays tend to have double, triple, quadruple meanings in every line of them. He is appealing, of course, to the learned, to the few. He is not interested in the multitudes, as he calls them, or the man in the street. In fact, you see that on the title page of his collected works in 1616. He had a great uh, bossy influence on how these works were put out, and he chose the quotation from Horace there on the title page, Neque me ut mirator turbo laboro contentus paucis lectoribus, which means I do not labour for the crowd to admire me, I am content with a few readers. In the same book, John Selden, his friend, a very learned jurist, writes in the title pages, hailing Johnson, let others write their songs for the crowd in the street, you like to delight the ears of the learned, those of the few. It's very important that we understand this when we're reading Ben Jonson, because unless you're feeling confident and fit and proud of your learning, you are almost certainly going to fail to understand uh, what he is saying. And a lot of the learning, of course, means classical learning. Those who couldn't understand uh, Ben Jonson in his lifetime, he airily dismissed as the ignoramus crew, the sluggish gaping auditor, or the multitude whose judgments are illiterate and rude. So bear that in mind, please, as we go on this journey to look at what is probably the most controversial, the most difficult of all of Ben Jonson's statements on William Shakespeare. He is being extremely clever here, and we're going to unpick it and show what he is really meaning uh, under the complicated surface that he gives us. This work called Timber or Discoveries was published after Jonson's death, but was undoubtedly laid out very carefully by him, possibly even in a sort of print form ready to go, but I suspect that he didn't want it to be published in his lifetime. It is called, uh, well, we generally know it as Discoveries. It says Timber or Discoveries. Discoveries, of course, meanings uncovering, taking the veil off, uh, taking the cover off. Uh, made upon men and matter as they have flowed of his daily readings or had their reflux to his peculiar notions of the times by Ben Jonson. And you see at the bottom another Latin quotation, this time from Perseus. Live with yourself, get to know how poorly furnished you are. So Johnson loves ticking everybody else off and saying they're not quite as clever as he is and they're not going to be able to understand what they're saying. Just before we look at the controversial passage on William Shakespeare, let's just take a quick look at some of the remarks he puts in front of his paragraph on Shakespeare, because obviously they're relevant to what comes next. He writes, the power of liberal studies lies more hid than it can be wrought out by profane wits. There you go, this intellectual snobbery again. The writer must lie and the gentle reader rests happy to hear the worthiest works misinterpreted, the clearest actions obscured, the innocentest life traduced. Indeed, the multitude commend writers as they do fencers or wrestlers, but in these things the unskilful are deceived. Is it a crime in me that I know that which others had not yet known but from me? or that I am the author of many things which never would have come in thy thought, but that I taught them. So he's telling us that people who he dismisses as the multitude cannot tell the difference between a writer and a fencer or a wrestler, and that he has said things which have come into, come to be believed by others. And is that, uh, he asks, is that a problem? Is that a fault? And these, as I say, are remarks that precede his remarks on William Shakespeare. So that's what we're going to look at. As I say, this is one of the 
most difficult, most controversial allusions to Shakespeare among the contemporary allusions. And uh, whatever side of the authorship divide you fall on, uh, there is argument about what this means. But I'm now going to, I hope, clear this up once and for all and show exactly what Johnson is intending and how it works. And it is typically very, very clever. So he starts, I remember the players have often mentioned it as an honour to Shakespeare that in his writing, whatsoever he penned, he never blotted out line. My answer hath been, would he had blotted a thousand, which they thought a malevolent speech. I had not told posterity this, but for their ignorance, who chose that circumstance to commend their friend by, wherein he most faulted. So Johnson kicks off by saying the players, that's to say the actors, were completely ignorant of Shakespeare, ignorant about his writing, whatsoever he penned, and that Johnson himself thought that Shakespeare was too wordy. Now, this has led many commentators to suppose that what he's actually talking about is Shakespeare, the actor Shakespeare of Stratford. He's not actually talking about the writer at all, and we'll come back to that. But what I want to look at first is the setup how it's on the page and what little meanings might be given us. We can see, for instance, that it consists of one paragraph with two margin notes. The first says De Shakespeare Nostrat, Nostrat being an abbreviated word, which is obviously a Latin word and has to be Nostratis, which would mean of our household, of our tribe, of our faculty, of our country, something like that. So concerning Shakespeare, of our tribe, if you like. Or it could be Nostratim, Shakespeare in our fashion, in the way we look upon him, or the players look upon him. So I'm going to add, it doesn't matter whether it's Nostra Team or Nostra Tis, it has to be two extra letters, and then down beneath it we see another margin note, Augustus in hat. If you look at the line that it's marking, as Augustus said of Haterius, so the proper Latin for that, if you take away the abbreviating dot, is Augustus in Haterium, uh, that's to say, Augustus speaking of Heterius. Now, if you fill those words in and take away the abbreviating dots, you find that you actually have 40 letters of margin note, which are annotating a paragraph of 17 lines. Now, I know I've gone on a lot about the numbers 1740, how they relate to Edward de Vere and his connection to the Holy Trinity and his connection to the name William Shakespeare. I am terrified of boring people to death by repeating endlessly this point and how it works and how it culminates in the great monument to William Shakespeare being placed above the remains of Edward de Vere in Westminster Abbey in 1740. I won't go on for the sake of those who just know my videos too well, but I can advise that anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about with the number 1740 to go to a video that I've put online called The Incalculable Genius of John D. And it's on my channel and I explain that very carefully and very clearly and I hope you'll find it very convincing there as a lot of Shakespeare's contemporaries seem to be connecting these numbers 1740 to Shakespeare, Oxford. Okay, I want to look now at just a few of the details in this paragraph, um, particularly this phrase, on this side idolatry. We know that idolatry is the setting up of false idols and is a sin in the eyes of God, obviously. Johnson writes of Shakespeare, and to justify mine own candour, for I loved the man and do honour his memory on this side, idolatry as much as any. Well, idolatry, as I said, is setting up false idols. And did Johnson honour Shakespeare's memory in an idolatrous way? You remember he was saying, is it a fault of me that I say things that people come to believe only because they heard me saying them? Is he worrying here? about the idolatrous honour of Shakespeare's memory. Indeed, is he talking about the famous poem which he wrote in the 1623 first folio of Shakespeare, to the memory of my beloved, the author in big writing, Mr. William Shakespeare and what he hath left us. That 17 word title, which sits at the top of 40 couplets, there's your 1740 again, is an expression in my view one of the most brilliant expressions of uh, truth 
as as hidden in this clever way that Johnson has. And there you see the author. He could easily have said to the memory of my beloved Mr. William Shakespeare, the author, but he chose to put it that way round. And if you read the poem, and I've described the poem and how it works elsewhere, he kicks off with 16 lines, explaining why he will not praise Shakespeare's name. Obviously he knows it's a pseudonym, and the poem starts, I therefore will begin on line 17. I won't go back over that, uh, but I just ask in relation to this phrase, on this side idolatry. Now, some people have argued that on this side of idolatry actually means stopping short of idolatry. He's saying he didn't, he wasn't quite idolatrous. Uh, there's another argument to say that on this side means on this side of the grave, on this side, in this earthly world, on the other side, is in the eternal life beyond, where, of course, there can be no idolatry. So I was very curious about what he really meant by on this side, idolatry, and I went on a little search to see if he had used the phrase on this side anywhere else, particularly in this work that would help me to understand it. And I did actually find an example and found it right here, where he uses on this side, truth. Now, interestingly enough, this is a paragraph about someone in the margent note who is described as Dominus Verulanus, whoever he is, Lord Verulanus. One, though he be excellent and the chief, is not to be imitated alone, for never no imitator ever grew up to his author. Likeness is always on this side truth. Yet there happened in my time one noble speaker who was full of gravity in his speaking. His language, where he could spare or pass by a jest, was nobly censorious. So we're talking about some nobleman here with a strange title, Dominus Verulanus. And this paragraph has on this side truth. So I wondered to myself whether it's like a coin, that the, the paragraph about Shakespeare is on this side idolatry and about Lord Verulanus on this side truth. And therefore I started to investigate the parallels between these two paragraphs and their connections. One thing I found very interesting, nay perhaps astonishing, uh, as I told you concerning Shakespeare in our fashion, uh, that one has 17 lines and 40 margin letters. And to get to the Lord Verulanus paragraph, one simply has to count uh, 17 paragraphs and 40 margent lines. So at very least, I thought to myself, these two paragraphs are connected by this magical Oxford Shakespeare number 1740. But there is, of course, a lot more to it than that. I'm going to look uh, particularly now at the bottom and uh, this bit where he talks about Augustus on Heterius. And explain how the few, the very intelligent, the learned reader would have read something into this that the less learned reader would simply not notice. And it's a connection to this book by Seneca the Elder called Controversiae. Now, Controversiae in Latin technically means contentions, quarrels, questions, disputes, or controversies sort of thing that we all seem to be having all the time over the identity of William Shakespeare, so perhaps it's rather apt. Um, I remember. Now, <laughs> that you might think is ridiculous, that you might spot a connection to Seneca's Controversiae just from the words, I remember. But in fact, if you've read Controversiae, you probably would, because in it, Seneca boasts at the beginning of his extraordinary memory and gives many examples of his saying he's got the best memory in the whole world. And he begins many of his sentences in Latin, memini, I remember. But there's much more clue to the connection between controversiae and what's going on here than just the word, I remember. So Seneca talks of Haterius, this uh, orator, and he says, I won't bother to read all the Latin, it ends there. You can see Haterius Nostus su Flaminandus Est. Uh, I'll just translate what Seneca says of Haterius. His speech was so rapid as to become a fault. Hence, divine Augustus cleverly remarked, our Haterius should be stopped. Now, what did Johnson say on Shakespeare right here? He flowed with that facility that sometimes it was necessary he should be stopped 
Suflaminandus erat, as Augustus said of Heterius. Now, the following sentence. Uh, Seneca writes of Haterius, his wit was in his own power, but its rule in someone else's. Johnson writes on his friend Shakespeare, his wit was in his own power, would the rule of it had been so too. Seneca, again writing of Haterius, writes often he fell into those things which could not escape mockery. Johnson, talking about Shakespeare, says many times he fell into those things could not escape laughter. Seneca gives an example of the ridiculous sort of thing that Haterius said to make us all laugh. As he said, defending a freedman of being his patron's lover, losing one's virtue is a crime in a freeborn, a necessity in a slave, a duty of a freedman. Such things were ridiculous. Johnson, writing of Shakespeare, gives an example, as when he said in the person of Caesar, one speaking to him, Caesar, thou dost me wrong. He replied, Caesar did never wrong, but with just cause, and such like, which were ridiculous. Again, he seems to be pointing to a Shakespeare here, who's an actor, not necessarily a playwright. I'll just finish off here. Seneca says of Heterius, but he redeemed his vices with his virtues, as there was more in him to praise than to pardon. Uh, Johnson writes of Shakespeare, but he redeemed his vices with his virtues. There was ever more in him to be praised than to be pardoned. So straight away, we can see that over half of Johnson's commentary on Shakespeare is simply lifted, a direct translation from Seneca talking about Haterius. Now, this is not new information I'm giving you here. It's been known about, but you won't find any Stratfordian commentator asking why. In fact, I haven't seen an Oxfordian commentator asking why. They tend to say, well, it just shows that he can't have known Shakespeare very well. He can't have been very intimate with him if half of his, his little paean paragraph to him has to be lifted directly from Seneca. But I think we need to dig deeper into this. and We've got to ask why on earth is Johnson comparing Shakespeare to Haterius. To understand this, we need to go back to controversy, back to Seneca and see what else he says about Haterius. Haterius could not do his own controlling. He had a freedman to look to and used to proceed according to how his freedman excited or restrained him. The freedman would tell him to make a transition when he had been on the same subject for a long time, and Haterius would make the transition. He would tell him to concentrate on the same subject, and he would stay on it. He would tell him to speak the epilogue, and he would speak it. His wit was in his own power, but its rule in someone else's. In other words, Heterius was a puppet, a puppet speaker, an actor, in other words, who was given his lines, told how to speak them, when to stop, when to start, by someone else, some unnamed person. This very much points, then, the whole of this Shakespeare passage to Shakespeare as the actor, as the player, not as the playwright. So let's look now at the other side of the coin, on this side, truth, the passage about Lord Verulanus, with all that in mind about Seneca's controversiae. It begins, one, though he be excellent and the chief, is not to be imitated alone, for never no imitator ever grew up to his author. Likeness is always on this side truth. Johnson would have been aware that the learned few, the clever clogses, as distinct from the sluggish gaping auditors and the common multitude, would have recognised this once again as coming from Seneca's controversiae, contentions, quarrels, questions, disputes, controversies. So again, there's an important link between this paragraph on Lord Verulanus and the paragraph on Shakespeare. It's not just about Numbers 1740, it's not just about the phrase, on this side, truth. The learned would have spotted the same connection to contentions, quarrels, questions, disputes, controversies, in which it is written, you should not imitate one man, however excellent, for an imitator never comes up to the level of his author. This is the way it is. The copy always falls short of the truth. A direct translation, then, from Seneca's Controversiae. Now, Seneca talks about another orator. This one is called Cassius Severus. And he says of Cassius Severus, the gravity which he lacked in his life, he possessed in plenty in his language, which as long as he restrained from jesting was censorious. Johnson writes of Lord Verulanus, 
He was full of gravity in his speaking. His language, where he could spare or pass by a jest, was nobly censorious. Well, that's almost a direct translation, except he's added the word nobly. He wants us to know that Lord Verulanus is a nobleman, one noble speaker, he calls him. Uh, Seneca writes of Severus. Everyone was afraid while he was speaking, lest he should stop. Johnson of Lord Verulanus, the fear of every man that heard him was lest he should make an end. And we hear Seneca talking on Severus. Nothing was superfluous in his speeches. There was no place where the listener could afford to let his attention wander. And Johnson, writing of Lord Verulanus, says, No man ever spake more pressly or suffered less emptiness, less idleness in what he uttered. His hearers could not cough or look aside from him without loss. So we can ask the same question that we asked. Why did Johnson uh, compare Shakespeare of Stratford with Haterius? Well, why is he now comparing Lord Verulanus on this side truth with Cassius Severus? I think it would be a bit naive just to say, well, Severus contains the name Vir. Uh, there's more to it than that. As Tacitus wrote of Severus, Augustus was the first who, in respect of the new libel law, took cognizance of lampoons, being provoked to it by the petulancy of Cassius Severus, who had defamed many illustrious persons of both sexes in his writings. Those who know their Shakespeare are aware that he was lampooning important people, illustrious people, a court of both sexes. For instance, Lord Burley seems to be made a fool of in the character of Polonius, Lord Leicester, in the character of Claudius, etc. Seneca writes in his Controversiae of Severus that his writings were far better heard than read. He wrote out whole speeches in full. He was a writer of speeches, rather like a playwright, as, let's say, William Shakespeare was. So if we compare the two sides of the coin, on this side idolatry, the setting up of false idols, we have Stratford Shakespeare as Quintus Haterius, the actor, puppet speaker. His wit was not in his power. His speeches were directed by some other unnamed man. And on this side truth, we have Edward de Vere, Cassius Severus, or Dominus Verulanus, both names have Vere in them, a brilliant writer of speeches, his wit was in his power, no one was in more complete control of his audience. This brilliant writer who went into exile, Cassius Severus, from the court, just as Edward de Vere was sent into exile from the court in England. So a typically cunning Johnsonian game is playing out here. On this side, idolatry, that's Stratford Shakespeare, of whom the players are ignorant, is suggested as the as a writer, whatsoever he wrote. Well, on this side, truth, Lord Verulanus, is described as a noble speaker. As Johnson's learned readers would have known, speaker need not mean one who speaks, but one who decides who speaks, on what subject, for how long, as the Speaker of the House of Commons, for instance, or indeed as the playwright William Shakespeare. Now that leaves only one mystery to be explained. Why is Johnson calling Edward de Vere, if that's who he is, Lord Verulanus? Now before I answer that question, I need to scotch the suppositions of a whole lot of Baconians who have always said that Lord Verulanus is in fact Francis Bacon, who had the title Lord Verulam, that's St Albans, uh, but then it would have to be a misprint. Oh, they just did a misprint, Lord Verulanus. It was meant to be Lord Verulamius, and they just got it wrong, and they got it right later on. No, 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 don't keep falling for this. It's just a misprint nonsense. I've put here, you'll see in red at the top, that's the end of the paragraph about Lord Verulanus, which ends the fear of every man that heard him was lest he should make an end. And then it goes straight on, talking about Cicero is said to be the only wit that people of Rome had equaled to their empire. We have had many. Now, that connects to the passage at the beginning of Lord Verulanus. He said, don't just imitate one man. You shouldn't have just one, though he be brilliant. We must have many people 
who are great as well, to compare him to. And so Johnson, continuing that argument, lists 16 writers here who are all brilliant writers. Scriptorium Catalogus, which shows that Lord Verulanus was a writer as well. And at the bottom of that list, we have Sir Francis Bacon. Now, Francis Bacon was, as I said, called Lord Verulam, but by the time this was written, he'd already superseded that title, and he was Viscount St Albans, and actually he was dead. But he's deliberately Sir Francis Bacon here, and is being compared, along with those other 15 writers, to Lord Verulanus. So, categorically, Dominus Verulanus cannot be Sir Francis Bacon, by misprint or by any other means. Okay, so if he is Edward de Vere, then we have to ask the question, why is Edward de Vere being called Lord Verulanus? Well, we know he was a concealed poet, a concealed playwright. Uh, we can see that Vere is in the name Verulanus, but there's got to be more than that to it, and indeed there is. There's your picture of Edward de Vere on the left, and on the right we have a wonderful illustration of a theatre from the famous book De Architectura. And that book, when it was published at the beginning of the 16th century, 1520 or so, I think had a an introduction by someone called Supitius Verulanus. This was the most famous Verulanus that one can possibly imagine at that time, and I have no doubt that Johnson is alluding to this Verulanus when he is describing Edward de Vere as Lord Verulanus. This 15th century rhetorician was at the vanguard of a movement to re-purify Latin. We remember how Nash said of Oxford, he was the first in our language I have encountered that re-purified poetry from art's pedantism and that instructed it to speak courtly. Edward de Vere was part of that anti-scholastic movement, very, very keen to bring the English language to the fore and to purify it in exactly the same way as Verulanus wanted to do with his native tongue, which was Latin. We also know that Verulanus was an ardent campaigner for a theatre for Rome to be built for the betterment of the city and used to elevate the minds and morals of the Roman people. Verulanus argued that the purpose of plays was both to teach and to delight. I would, at that point, what they call rest my case, but for the fact that some of you may not know that Edward de Vere went off to Italy, he came back and was an ardent campaigner for a theatre for London to be built for the betterment of the city and used to elevate the minds and morals of the English people, and that it was always his contention that plays were both to teach and delight, and he led, as we all know, a great scriptorium of clever playwrights who formed what was known as the secret of government, which was the policy of plays for the Privy Council. I really hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've understood it. I hope it's clear. Of course, nothing of Ben Jonson is ever very clear. He's always being cunning. And as he says, he is always writing for the few, for the learned, for the clever. I just hope I've managed to explain it well enough to you today that you may consider yourselves among the few, among the learned, among the clever, and dissociate yourself from the sluggish, gaping auditor, from the multitude from those who simply can only read what's on the surface of Ben Jonson and not understand the full, deep, incredible, clever wit with which Ben Jonson talks about everything, not least William Shakespeare. Thank you very much indeed for watching this video. I hope you will share it and that if you're not subscribed already to this channel that you will subscribe so you get the first chance to see a new lecture when I put one up. Have a very happy day. Goodbye.